so hi, first of all, just saying hello. Uh, my name is John Dickinson. I'm the Chief Commercial Officer at Equal Experts. Um, and I wanted to welcome you all from across the USA to our webinar on building high-performing remote work teams. Uh, the purpose of the webinar is to share some of the experiences we've gained at Equal Experts through building remote working teams. Um, first of all, first off, it's important to recognize that these are highly stressful and challenging times. So with virtually the whole world in lockdown for uh, some people working from home or working away from their team members, it can be a stressful uh, and also a difficult time. Um, so it's important to us that we're able to share with you some of the tips and tricks that we've learned that will hopefully make this experience easier for you. We've worked within remote teams and distributed delivery for some time. The mechanics of being able to still highly perform in this way are quite different to when you uh, can co-locate all in the same physical space. Um, but with that, I'd like to introduce, introduce to you the three people uh, that are going to that are joining me today. So we've got uh, Naya Dat. Hi there, nice to meet you. We've got Dave Hewitt. Hi, uh, g'day. And we've got Lisa Copland. Hello there. Um, and they've all worked with remote teams uh, and also with a remote first mindset. Uh, and I'll share with you some hints and tips on making this way of working easier. Um, so Dave, if you wanna kick us off. Yeah, okay, so a lot of this um, that we have on this Miro board is based off a playbook that we put on remote working. Well, we put together the end of last year. In December, we, we created a playbook that was effectively for internal consumption, but uh, we open sourced it at the same time. And this this was the starting uh, starting point of this talk. Um, we've gone through a lot of the equal experts teams and uh, associated clients over the last uh, couple of weeks on it, and we've also been adding as we go as people have provided feedback into into the webinar and uh, given us hints and tips of their own, which has been amazing. Absolutely. So the way that we're going to do this is we'll be taking you through, as Dave mentioned, this Miro board. So Miro is a virtual whiteboarding tool, if you're not familiar with it. There is a link in the chat, I believe, uh, to the board. So you're more than welcome to click into the link and get direct access to it. Otherwise, feel free to watch me. I'll be sharing my screen anyway. So we'll be going through... Uh, through the talk uh, on this mirror board. Um, at any point throughout the talk, please feel free to throw down any questions in the Q&A section and we'll do our best to sort of answer the questions as we're going, but then also at the end. Right, so uh, let's just start by acknowledging that working in a remote team is hard. You know, it's about moving from a physical office into a virtual office and it very much feels like all of a sudden someone switched off the light because we lose visibility, it feels like we lose a lot of flexibility in terms of what we can and can't do and see. And that results in a feeling of less control as well over what we can do and how we can work together. So a lot of what we're gonna be talking about is how we can actually increase visibility, increase flexibility, and actually also regain back a lot of control in terms of how we work by ourselves, but also with our colleagues. So to begin with, it would be great to talk a little bit about what we mean by being remote friendly versus remote first. Uh, a lot of teams that we work with have been remote friendly rather than remote first. And in order to kind of explain that kind of shift, we'd like you to cast your mind back to maybe 10 years ago, when we used to build websites around 10 years ago, maybe a little bit older um, or further back, we used to build mobile friendly websites. And then there was a bit of a shift because mobile phones became ubiquitous. So as that happened, we actually shifted from building mobile friendly websites to mobile first websites. And what that meant was that we had to think about mobiles from the very start rather than as an afterthought. So we had to understand what the constraints were around mobile devices. As an example, the fact that they have much smaller screen displays, but we could also leverage the capabilities. So there were a lot of positive things that came from it. Like for example, you can use a mobile phone wherever you like, you're not just constrained to using it at a desk anymore. So we went through that shift from building mobile friendly to mobile first websites. And it's a very similar shift that we believe teams need to go through now from being remote friendly to remote first. So again, this is about thinking about a virtual office from the very start. So rather than thinking about a physical office and then how do we make that work in the virtual world, start thinking about the virtual office. And that involves understanding the constraints. So the fact that we lose visibility of each other and what we're doing 
but there's also a lot of uh, capabilities that we can leverage. For example, it's a lot easier to co-create in certain ways when we are using virtual collaboration tools. One example of that would be if I was to raise a post-it right now on this board in Miro and just write a couple of things on it, Dave could actually correct some spelling mistakes as I'm typing and maybe upvote or downvote my post-it. If we were to try to do exactly the same thing in real life, so if we were in a physical office and I was writing on a physical whiteboard and Dave reached over my shoulder and started correcting my mistakes, that would be incredibly inappropriate and aggressive behavior. So the point is that there are some things that work in the physical world that don't work in the remote world. And there are some things that work in that virtual remote world that don't work in the physical world. So we, that's why we need to think about this virtual office from the start and really leverage those opportunities. And another aspect around that is really around some of the flexibility that gets unlocked. So as an example, uh, some people choose to still work nine to five when they're working from home. There is an advantage, though, or there is a possibility to be able to integrate your day with work, social, home kind of commitments throughout the day. So you have a far more integrated day. It is harder to manage, but it does allow you greater flexibility when you are working from home. So we will talk a little bit about how you can manage that effectively. So in summary, we do believe that teams should shift from being remote friendly to remote first. And to really sort of land that, what we'd like to do is now take you through a typical story of what it's like being in a remote friendly team. And then we'll talk a little bit about those anti-patterns and then we'll actually talk about what it's like being in a remote first team and share all the great practices that we've been able to experience, but also witness speaking to colleagues. So I'd like you to cast your mind back to what it was like uh, working in the office maybe a month ago. I'd like you to imagine you've got a colleague, Sam, who wakes up one day and realises that her son is sick. So Sam realises she has to work from home while the rest of the team is actually in the office. So the first thing that she does is she loads up her laptop, she gets herself a cup of tea and she's ready for stand up or the catch up first thing in the morning with the team. And she's waiting for the team to dial her in. So one of her colleagues loads her up on a laptop, he dials her in, uh, has some problems connecting. One of her colleagues can't really hear her all that clearly because the sound, the speaker on the laptop might not be great. And there might be some sort of side chatter happening during stand-up as well. So even though she's trying really hard, Sam can't see the board very clearly. She can't hear everybody very clearly. And she certainly can't even move her own tickets. So what we see here is all of a sudden, Sam is not an equal member of the team. There's a bit of a power divide now, where she's no longer on the same foot as everybody else in the team. And this shift in the dynamics is exactly what it's like being in a remote friendly team versus being in a remote first team. In a remote first team, everybody's on the same page. So this sort of shift in the power dynamics and access of information continues throughout the day. For example, some of her colleagues around lunchtime might decide to get a bite together or they might decide to go get coffee. And these are incredible moments to connect with your colleagues as human beings, but also to talk about sometimes work-related topics, but in a totally different forum where your creative juices kind of get running and you actually have quite a bit of fun riffing off each other and having ideas. So what can also happen with folks who are working from home is that they can start to feel a little guilty and actually work much longer hours. In this case, Sam ends up working much longer than her colleagues because she feels like she has to prove that she's actually working when she's working from home. And this is a common story that we hear where sometimes people will ask you whether you were really working or whether you were quote unquote working from home. And that kind of, it hints at a certain cynicism or skepticism whether or not you actually were working. And so, this is what a typical experience has been like as we've spoken to teams across the world, you know, um, as to what it's like being in a remote friendly team. Now, today, obviously, no one's working in the office. Everybody's working from home. But just because everybody's working from home, it doesn't mean that we are a remote first team and there are, there's an equal playing field for everybody. Because to be a remote first team, there are some fairly substantial things that need to be in place in order to actually be effective as a, as a remote first team. So the first thing is that actually you need to make a lot more effort in order to be able to convey things, to understand things, which is why it's actually quite tiring working from home. We need to have a lot more discipline in terms of saying no, focusing, prioritizing our time. 
we also need to work in a very different way with different tools. And there's obviously a bit of a learning curve associated with this. So all of these things, coupled with a shift in mindset, move us towards becoming a remote first team. And that includes becoming a lot more inclusive and having a strong focus on inclusion for the whole team and everybody having equal access. It involves us by default, trusting our colleagues. So rather than being skeptical, actually assuming they are working or they are doing the right thing. And especially in these difficult times, it really does involve us having a lot of empathy for each other and supporting teammates as they're struggling with different aspects of working from home. So the one thing that we see really effective remote first teams do well is they set up their basics really well. So they have a very deliberate onboarding into their virtual office. So it's very similar to how when you started working at your office, you would have had some sort of induction process. You know, HR or your line manager would have introduced you to people, shown you where the stationary cupboard was and so on. So it's a very similar kind of exercise we recommend for teams as they're going into this virtual office. Yeah, and in the same way as um, many teams will set up some sort of team charter, which is a uh, creating a social contract between the team members about ways of working, etc. We suggest you do something very, very similar um, with uh, with your team, but being very deliberate about your remote working working practices. And what we're going to cover over the next 15, 20 minutes is things that can be um, put into or discussed as a team uh, for that uh, for that charter. So, <clears throat> excuse me, um, there's a link on the mirror board uh, there which uh, goes off onto the playbook. So please feel free to go there, uh, go to that. That gives you a, um, a template for a charter. Then, then this one's going to sound blindingly obvious and hopefully you'll, you'll understand why I'm, why I'm uh, calling it out. But your home office kit is super important. And it's important for two reasons. One, which is obviously my comfort. You know, I want a nice comfy chair. I want dual monitors because it's easy to work with and, and all that sort of stuff. But actually, it's the other audience that we, it's very easy to forget about, which is your, your colleagues. You need good home office kit to support your colleagues and to be able to hear you, to see you properly, um, have the right environment. So for example, having a quiet space to work in, super important. Um, having a decent uh, microphone. So there is a difference going up from my boom mic to my, to my laptop. I've got a decent laptop, so may, maybe not that difference, but you can imagine if you're in a slightly noisy environment, it makes a lot of difference to be able to have something um, which is a directional, a directional mic. Likewise, reliable Wi-Fi. Um, I've had to splash out, splash out on plugging my um, my computer, my laptop directly into the router because the Wi-Fi was too patchy. Um, so <clears throat> I do all of this not for me because I can talk fine. I do it because it makes the experience for my colleagues much much easier. Um, dual, dual screens is, a, is another good example where um, actually it helps because then you can have people's faces on videos up, I can connect to them um, for that and I can also do my work at the same time. So having that space on, your, space on monitors so I can actually see my clothes while I'm working. Um, we go, go through the tools and um, obviously other tools exist and I was, I was going to put things like Teams and things like this on, on here, but um, you need to select your tools based on how good they are at collaboration rather than how good they are or how, how used we are to using them. So for example, using Microsoft Word versus Google Docs is a massive experience difference. You know, one's feature rich, but not very good at collaboration. One's amazing at collaboration, that's okay on the features. But, this is the lens that you should be looking th uh, looking at for your tools. So um, having a virtual whiteboard, uh, sort of like uh, the tool that we're using here is um, Miro. It's uh, lots of people can come in, collaborate, um, update, edit simultaneously. Mural is another version of the same sort of thing. Uh, a lo-fi but equally effective version is uh, Google Drawing. Um, but go for the tools and technologies that allow you to collaborate rather than just because of the history, uh, the history of what we've been using. Um, moving on to some etiquette. Now, there's a really good uh, Basecamp have some really great articles, and one of the things I really liked was 
uh, group chat has like been an all day meeting with random participants and no agenda. I mean, it's just bit, 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 bit coming at you all the time. Do I answer, do I not, et cetera. So it's important to manage that, corral that and use it effectively. And there's plenty of things that we can do to make it more, more effective. Um, there's, <coughs> excuse me, there's uh, things like making sure you summarize uh, thoughts. So instead of just splatting things down, wait, thought, think about it, and then put a summary in. That would be, that'd be good. Um, maybe it's a case of you start with a conversation on the team channel, you go off onto a video chat, um, and then you go back and you summarize it uh, back to the rest of the team so they, have, uh, they remain or, or keep up with the context of the conversations. Um, mention people by names, so everybody knows who the message is directed to, if there's more than one person on there. Have specific channels for specific chat topics, so you can choose to mute them if you're not so interested, or you're interested in passing, but it's not your day-to-day. -day. So just be really considerate, and there's some, there's some great guides um, on, the, uh, on the Remote Working Playbook that will give you a lot more hints and tips about using your messaging tool. On your video, uh, chat. Uh, uh, now, I'm a big fan of uh, video on default, but on by default, and the reason I think that's important is because it gives you better uh, social con connection, a better human connection. I can I can look at somebody and I can see whether they have understood my question. Um, maybe they were distracted. Um, you know, there's there's a lot you get in a, as far as body language goes back by being able to see somebody, and like you wouldn't walk into. Uh, an office if I was co-located with a team and then we went to a meeting we just go to separate phone booths and pick up a landline that just doesn't make any sense so whilst the the video conferencing the video on conferencing might not be quite as good as the being there in real life actually it's a lot better than just having that over the phone now I understand that there are sometimes uh, bandwidth issues and all that kind of stuff but if you start a meeting for example with a video on make a bit of a connection Create that, uh, create that, uh, yeah, create that thing between uh, between people. Then maybe switch it off after that. Um, and and little things make a big difference as well. So um, if there's a big meeting, go on mute by default so you don't distract the talker or the listeners. Um, there's a great tools. So for example, Zoom um, has good push to talk facilities. So you just uh, press the space bar. Teams, I'm pretty sure, has the same. Google Hangouts has the same. So Look, um, you know, look for these things to make it easier. As I say, it's not uh, as easy for your colleagues um, to hear the conversation and it's less taxing on them as well. Awesome. So like these are a lot of the basics that we see these sort of remote first teams really focus on and really nail before they start to focus on other areas. So just wanted to quickly address the question that was raised by Robert, which was around bringing a new team member into, I think it was a software engineering team. So, I mean, the best way to do that is to really onboard that team member through something like a team charter because it sets the rules not only for the new person but also for the existing team and just realigns everybody in terms of like some common practices and tools as well. Um, and as we go through, there are going to be more things as well that will feed into that team charter, not just these sorts of basics. Um, so we'll continue to build on that as we go through this webinar. And so can I just uh, just add something there as well? It's It's really important to build up trust and there's a number of things that you need to do to build that trust and maintain that trust so for example having video on is actually it makes it easier for people to trust uh, trust you um, you need to you need to create a, a a common ground and that means you need to share context so um, obviously you onboard to people normally as, as you would normal normally do in a physical world you do it by going and providing them um, you know background information about what the system does and all that sort of stuff. Um, you need to over, overly work that, I think. Um, so, for example, pairing is a great way of, of sharing context. Um, but you, you also need, you know, they need, to, they need to feel that sense of legitimacy as well. And so they need to understand what the social rules are and the social norms within the team. So you make it as easy as possible for them to, to feel that. Absolutely. And we're going to talk about some social practices as well that will really help with that. And Neha, just on one last thing, I, I think real-time learning, um, we might be adding the addition of a family charter. Now that we are all self-quarantined or whatever word is 
globally acceptable with our families and things, we are finding um, the need and some experience around how to set up a family charter. Um, when are the meeting rooms, how you're sharing space, especially for those who are in smaller spaces with more people. Yeah, that's a great point. It's not just for the team, it's for the family as well. Mm -hmm. Um, so then the next kind of area that we see these remote first teams really nail is after they've got those basics and they're all aligned in terms of those basics, they then start looking at the rituals. So these are the practices, you know, that help them balance work, social and home life. And the main tool that's used for this is actually the calendar. So you can see here that we've got a calendar over here and it's got various anchors. These anchors basically help us get a sense of how far are we through the day. They help us chunk up our time, whether it's throughout the day or throughout the week and get a sense of perspective. So for example, we might have anchors to start work or to finish work, perhaps anchors to take a break or even think. So we've seen people block out time for thinking to make sure that they get a bit of context shifting and they can actually think broader before they go back in uh, and, and focus on sort of lower level tasks. There's also lots of social anchors that we can have in place, like having one-to-one -one coffees with people. And that, that would be great for a new starter to be able to have virtual coffees with teammates and get to know them much better. Even having remote team lunches, for example, that's quite a common practice. Um, there are uh, other aspects as well around how we manage meetings. So meetings are obviously very common and we've certainly spoken to a lot of teams who've said they've been inundated with even more meetings and more video calls than usual. So one question to ask yourselves and your teams is whether we can actually minimize meetings. One thing that remote teams do really well is they actually run asynchronous meetings. So what we mean by asynchronous meetings are, if you imagine you've got a retrospective that's been booked for a week, Rather than have a 45 minute call where everybody's together and adding onto a board and prioritizing things and agreeing actions, what you can do instead is actually set up a board a couple of days earlier, get people to add things to the board and comment and upvote in their own time. And then that way you only need to have, say, a 15 minute call just to discuss the things that really need a discussion. And what that does is it gives way more control back to the individuals because they can choose when they want to do the work. It also means that people can take as long as they want because some people work at different paces. So rather than everybody working at the slowest pace of the person who's in the team, you can actually work at your own pace and just make sure you minimize the amount of time that's spent on video calls. Uh, another thing that we've seen some remote first teams do is uh, they have something called a variable agenda meeting. And it's basically a, 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 a kind of like a time box that's been set throughout the week. So it might be two hours, let's say every day for the week. And during that time, the entire team needs to be free to be able to join into conversations. And so at the beginning of that session, everybody will put down the topics they want to discuss, they'll prioritize them, and they'll work through them almost like a lean coffee. So it means that everybody's really focused because it's time boxed conversations, they get the answers that they want, and then they can move back and actually focus on other types of work without having further meetings come around during the day. So that's been very effective. And if for whatever reason you can't reduce the meetings, then we can absolutely do things to still keep meetings really focused. One thing is to actually get into a habit of joining meetings a little bit earlier. So you have time to socialize, et cetera, before the meeting starts. And then make sure that meetings don't go to the half hour to the, or to the full hour. So rather than an hour meeting, just have it for 45 minutes. And by doing that, it means that people have to really focus on what's more important because it's only 45 minutes. It also gives you a 15 minute breather just in case you have a meeting in the, in the next hour. So it gives you time to get up, go have a walk, do a stretch, whatever it is, which again will actually make you feel a lot more energized and less drained from being on calls all day long. Then sort of adding on to meetings, like for the meetings that you do have to have, uh, there are other things in order to make meetings more effective. So we've seen some practices like some teams running their meetings like a design sprint. And what that looks like is the first half of the meeting is very structured where people get very specific about what's the question they want to answer, what are their underlying assumptions and really test out these things and really get onto the same page and align 
And then they specifically start talking about solutions. What are all the possible answers or solutions we could have out there? And again, they converge and agree on a specific answer based on the selection criteria they've objectively come up with. And the amazing thing about this process, about the design process, is that it massively reduces circular conversations because a lot of the reasons why we have circular conversations is because we have different assumptions that we haven't called out and we're talking about problems and solutions at the same time. So this nicely separates those things and it keeps the conversations very focused and gets you making decisions a lot faster. There's, a, there's also a tool or a practice called a lightning decision jam. So if you click onto this link, you'll be able to have a look and watch a video about how to do that. But again, it's a very effective way of making decisions much faster. And one of the key things to sort of remember around these remote meetings is that it's really important to be able to have a um, have type facilitation strong time boxing and having really visual sort of whiteboards, virtual whiteboards that people can work off in order to be able to convey ideas and really share, get a shared understanding and things. So this tool, Miro, is great because you can not only add post-its and embed pictures and videos, but you can also use a freehand drawing tool in order to sort of um, draw on top of post-its and, and drawings. And then if there's further tips that you'd like around facilitating these meetings, we have some tips in our remote working playbook and there is a fantastic guide by Mural on how to actually facilitate remote workshops. Just a quick note maybe on managing energy levels because one thing that I'm sure you'll notice is that when you do have virtual meetings, it can be quite draining. And so there are things that you can do in order to make sure the energy levels are maintained. So there's aspects around thinking really hard about how our tone of voice is actually being conveyed. So to Dave's point about how your team members actually experience you, if you're tired, um, people will hear it in your voice and that can also bring down the mood and the energy levels for everybody else. So sometimes we actually need to amplify certain emotions just in order to kind of get the momentum going and to not drain people. It's not sustainable to do it all the time, but sometimes it's actually really, really effective. And it's also quite worthwhile thinking about meetings and actually breaking them up into smaller chunks. So rather than have a two hour meeting, break it up into two lots of 45 minutes split over two days. It gives people a bit of thinking time in between as well. And by making it 45 minutes, again, we force people to really focus on what's important. Uh, if you'd like to check them out, we've actually got some online icebreakers and some physical movements that you could also do in order to stretch and sort of do activities as a team. We won't talk about them, but feel free to check them out and let us know what you think. So we have other rituals as well, which might sound quite familiar. Yeah, so, so the familiar stand up, I'm, I'm assuming that everybody understands what one is, but um, if you have a uh, 15 minutes at the start of each day, that's a great way to tag on what uh, Neha mentioned earlier, which is have a, a kind of an unofficial rule that people join early to a meeting. It gives you that opportunity for a bit of chit chat, a little bit of social connection um, in a, a regular, regularly scheduled meeting. Um, also, if you're doing things like, um, if you're announcing on your stand up over a video video call that you know you got to huddle afterwards and it's going to be on this particular topic make sure that everybody can hear you just because you've announced it on on your video somebody's uh, somebody's video wi-fi might have cut out so they didn't quite hear it so close the loop by putting that information into your slack channel or your team's channel that so everybody understands what's happening next and it's very very clear for, for people um we we seem well we're finding people um, or teams take this format of the stand up and then extending it as well so um, Neha mentioned the variable agenda meeting so doing something similar to that as a way of everybody coming together identifying the the key high priority items to discuss discuss those as a team as a way of reducing further meetings uh, throughout the day so get them out of the way at the beginning um, everybody everybody's aligned and then they can get on get the job done, head down, um, et cetera, without disruption, et cetera. Uh, the, the sort of the weekly demo, so the wider stakeholder demo, I think that's that's great and that's the sort of thing that would, um, probably remains pretty unchanged. But what we're finding is we have teams um, adding uh, flash demos. So a, um, a, a feature is completed, they've, they've, they've arranged a uh, show, 
a demo it to the product owner and they announce it on the team channel so everybody can come in and, and see that this is a way within the team to keep up to date with what's going on what features are what features are happening and if you keep those sort of things really short and succinct then record it uh, share the recording so the rest of the team can get on and um, keep up with that asynchronously so they don't have to join if, if they don't want to. Um, another thing we're finding is towards the end of the day um, we have teams where they're doing effectively daily daily demos so any, any pieces of work that is ready for demoing um, they get the opportunity to share it within the team um, so other team members understand where they're, where, where they're at and what's going on. Absolutely. And then that sort of takes us on to the more social aspects of so the social rituals, which are also so important for keeping a team together and keeping people sane. So this is very much around the idea of physical distancing rather than social distancing, because obviously we still need to be socially connected as teammates and as humans. So there's different forms of organized versus organic ways that we're seeing teams do this. Obviously, you've seen earlier on, we showed a calendar where social activities have been booked in, like coffee sessions, lunches, etc. Uh, we've also seen some remote first teams do things like actually set up a virtual room, which is basically an open video call that stays open all of the time. And as people join, there might be a notification that's sent. So you can actually nicely, quite randomly bump into people in the virtual, in the virtual world. So uh, that's something that seems to work quite well for individuals as well as for teams. Yeah, so um, uh, we have a team uh, that opens up a effectively a virtual lunch. Um, so they have a channel open uh, just during lunchtime and that's their opportunity to get together if they choose to. It's purely optional to get together if they choose to and, and share that social connection a little bit. Um, another team does a slightly more formal version of a similar thing where they get together as a team once a week um, and they have two very strict rules, which is uh, not talking about work and don't need noisily down the microphone. So these are, these are ways of keeping that social connection going. You know, as we've, we might have that now because we've worked together um, really closely, co-located perhaps, but it's very, it will degrade very quickly over time. So we need to make sure we put things in place that, that keep that connection going. Absolutely. And, and some people were talking a little bit about, uh, you know, how different teams really have their own culture really come out in terms of how they choose to socialize. So uh, there's one team that we've heard of who actually, um, they had 20% time, like free time. So they use that time to actually create a virtual office in Minecraft. And so the idea is that when people start the day, they go to their office, their virtual office in Minecraft. When they want to have a break, they go to the coffee point and there's like an open video call for that. So you can actually quite nicely see that virtual world and feel like you're almost actually in an office. Um, again, that is extremely geeky. So that's not necessarily for everybody, but it's really nice to see the team culture played out in terms of how they want to interact with each other. And we've seen other teams do things like have a crazy hat Friday where everybody has to wear a crazy hat or there might be various sort of banter channels like, you know, in the instant messaging service that, that teams are using. Um, and, and also things like team drinks as well, um, creating those social, um, social events that you would normally get. Uh, we've had quite a lot, certainly within Equal Experts, where um, on a Friday somebody's organised quite a big team drinks for across across equal experts and that's been really successful people really enjoy it so um, again it's about maintaining those social connections with our colleagues yeah absolutely and one of the sort of fine lines that you might need to tread is trying to figure out okay how can you make sure that you can facilitate fun but not mandate it because when it starts to feel like it's forced obviously it stops feeling like fun and wherever that line is is going to be different for different teams and that line is going to shift over time as teams start to become more comfortable experimenting online so just give things a go and play around with it and have a bit of fun so once these sort of remote first teams nailed the communications, sorry, nailed the sort of rituals and, um, and, and what their anchors are going to be, uh, then we start to talk about some things that are a little bit more almost philosophical, but also harder to nail and to get right. So this is very much around communication and communicating very deliberately. Of course, we've all heard that we need to over communicate. That does mean not only sharing, but actually listening a lot more than we're used to. So one of the things that uh, 
that one of our colleagues actually does very well also is being very deliberate about how we communicate and be very specific about communicating a few steps ahead. So for example, if you imagine that um, I'm finishing work in a couple of hours, I might say, hey folks, it's gonna take me a bit longer to finish work and that's it. So that's not very specific. And that doesn't really tell the person who I'm communicating to what that means for them. Instead, if I was to say, hey folks, it's actually taking me a bit longer to finish this task. So I think I might have something ready to show by 2 p.m. Is anybody ready um, to actually demo and give me some feedback, thumbs up, thumbs down? That's actually communicating a few steps ahead. And the great thing about that is, um, as Dave mentioned earlier on, by communicating a bit of a summary, we massively reduce the feedback cycle times. So in real life, if I was very vague in how I communicated, you could ask me a qualifying question and we to and fro a couple of times just within half a minute. To do that to and froing over communications like Slack or messaging services can actually sometimes take hours because not everybody's on, on the device at the same time. So in order to massively reduce that and still have momentum, it makes sense to actually think a couple of steps ahead and communicate a couple of steps ahead each time. Uh, kind of, um, there is a, a, a guide written by Basecamp, which is actually a really, really good read. So we'd highly recommend clicking into that and having a read um, if you've got some time. Uh, and just the other thing also just around how we communicate is that it can feel quite awkward sometimes when you're on a video call and you ask a question and then there's pin drop silence. It can sometimes feel like you actually want to speak over that, that silence, you know, and like fill that void we highly recommend actually embracing that silence because it might feel unnatural. However, it's really necessary when we are in a remote world because first of all, not everybody's gonna respond straight away because it takes some time to unmute themselves. Secondly, some people are actually still thinking. So different people will think at different paces and not be ready to respond straight away. The third thing is that, and this is something I certainly do, um, some people don't wanna actually be the first person to respond because they're afraid of speaking over, over somebody. So just knowing a couple of these things makes it a lot easier to kind of embrace these awkward silences and make sure we do create that space to get some feedback from people. Otherwise, it's much easier for us to actually lose alignment and not really confirm whether or not people have understood what we're saying or whether we're all in agreement. And another way that you could do that without the, the verbal cues is to actually use physical cues, uh, sorry, visual cues. So uh, you could ask like whether people are happy to move on, thumbs up, or they wanna continue talking, thumbs down. So just even having those sorts of cues gives you a lot of feedback, which again makes it much easier to, to communicate given that you actually aren't physically together. Yeah, so uh, something um, that with the silo that you can create around your uh, team is you lose context about what's happening in the wider organization. So there needs to be mechanisms within organizations to uh, to bridge that and provide that provide that context. So for example, having an all, all hands call, um, perhaps once a week or once a fortnight, it might only be 15 minutes or half an hour, um, where people can come in, ask, uh, do Q and A's with uh, senior leadership. Um, but that's important because whilst we will create um, good tight bonds with our immediate team, it'll be very, very easy to lose that with um, other parts. So we need to know and we need to understand why we're doing this work, why that priority was changed, um, what's the big threat to the business, should I be worrying about that or not? So having that communication channel um, open just helps us understand where the team that we're working on fits into the organisation and are we pulling in the right direction still. Um, yeah. Um, Excuse me. Uh, the other the other thing is on communication is around signalling, and this is about I guess extending that social contract with our with our colleagues. So, a lot of the messaging tools will have um, statuses that you can set, and if we if we're deliberate about the statuses and we use them deliberately, then. Um, we can send signals out to, to our colleagues. So for example, if I want to just skip my head down, start coding for a couple of hours, I just don't want to be disturbed. Um, if I put um, in the zone back at three o'clock, um, people will understand that one, if they um, do send me a message, I might not respond to it, or preferably perhaps don't even send me that message. So I've created this social contract that uh, for my colleagues to look at my status and go, okay, I'm, I'll ask a question to somebody else, or the question's not urgent, I'll, I'll wait a little bit longer. Uh, the, other, the other important signal is about sort of starting and stopping your day. A lot of people complain about 
their workday bleeding into their home life. Um, so a way of telling your uh, your colleagues that this is this isn't happening anymore is when you first start your day, we you sit down at the keyboard, just say hi. Then people understand that you're you're good to go, ready to go for the day. Likewise, at the end of the day, and probably more importantly, at the end of the day, is um, just say bye, see you tomorrow. So that way you've created again the social contract where I've shut the day. Um, people understand that if I send a message that I might not get a response because they're, they're no longer working. Um, and you can take that one step further by saying what your plans are tomorrow. So <clears throat> if um, I'm going to be late, I've got a doctor's appointment. By C or 11, I've got a doctor's appointment. And that, again, that people understand what's happening um, next in, in my day. Yeah, definitely. It just feels more normal, doesn't it? Yeah, it's the sort of thing that happens in a regular physical or co-located office anyway as you walk out the door, see you tomorrow, going to be a bit late, and that's what we're trying to replicate here. Yeah. Cool. Um, so just before we move on to the next section, there's a question from Scott um, so asking uh, suggestions based on our experience for top collaboration tools for organic uh, open call virtual rooms. So this isn't the scheduled calls that you have for say a stand up or for um or a, or a planning meeting but it's um more informal uh, we, uh, uh organic relational connections that are that are more of a challenge um so i'll 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 start with a, a story that i've heard from from one team um that's uh working at that John Lewis was part of a blog post we released recently where they set up a, um, what are these? These Meet, um, Google, not Hangouts, Google Meet. Uh, and they had an, like an always on essentially room that was running and that they all could connect to. Uh, and I think that's, I think that's beneficial over something like Zoom because you don't have to have your own one up. You can just have it set up and running and then other people can join it. And then that was there. It was just sort of always on and running in the background, so people could jump into it. They could have it on for a period of time, and then all off while they kind of worked either pairing or isolated. But there was like half a day or a couple of hours where it was just everybody together. But also they used that for when there was um, a, a problem they had to swarm on. There was then there was no didn't have to worry about organizing a location to go to talk. It was just, oh, I'll see you in the room. And then suddenly the whole team's there and they're all swarming on the problem. Five, 10 minutes later, it's resolved. Everyone's back to their, their, their normal uh, working schedule. Um, so that's one example I've, I've, I've heard about. Yeah, and uh, a couple of my teams use, um, yeah, use Zoom. So they effectively have a, a Zoom ID, which is the team team one that they use for stand-up they use for any of those meetings and that's the one that they have so for lunchtime that's the one that will be open for stand-up that's the one that will be open and very similar in way which is I want to remove as much friction as possible to people knowing where to go uh, and how to join etc but you're right in that case it very much removes that option of I've got if I've got my personal one for example and that's the one that's used um, that removes the option for me using that uh, personally. Mm. Yeah, I think whatever tool you use, like it definitely helps at least um, there's something that needs to be somewhat visual about it. So so that you get some sort of a cue that actually someone's there so that you can go catch up with them, for example, or bump into them. Like that's one aspect of, of the organic kind of communication or the organic forum. Um, another thing is around the accessibility side, which you both touched on, which is that by having something always on, it makes it so much easier for people to be able to connect. So like there was one team uh, that I worked with and uh, so when some people were in the office and some people were working from home, it, it didn't really matter. Um, in the office, we basically had a big screen and it had like a video feed from everybody who was in the team. So you could see whether people were working or whether they weren't. And because it was a high trust team, it wasn't a matter of then telling people off if they weren't working. You know, it was just to know whether people were around so you could bounce ideas off them. And again, like everybody was dialed into a, a video call that just stayed for the whole day and you could dip in and out. But because you had that visual cue of seeing whether people were there or not, that actually made it feel quite normal. So I've seen that also work for the people who are working from home where they'd have two monitors and one of them actually had the whole team up. There's an interesting question here about, um, uh, we're talking a lot obviously about real-time communication. Um, what about 
uh, people working remotely where there are different time zones and, and shifts in time zone. I think that's really where the asynchronous meetings uh, style comes in. Uh, Neha, do you want to talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, absolutely. So one of our most complex projects actually um, uh, was where we had four different locations, all different time zones from every, almost every continent. Um, and what we did is we kind of followed the sun. So we made sure that, uh, so between the UK and India, we had a stand up so that we were crossing over. Then between India and Australia, we had a stand up where we were crossing over. Then between Australia and the US, we had a stand up and then between US and, and London. So what we did is we made sure that there was some touch point that existed between at least two locations. And then outside of that, everything was done asynchronously. So those stand ups were literally just opportunities to be able to escalate things or get clarity on items, not a traditional kind of stand up. And everything else was done asynchronously. So we used Zeppelin, for commenting on designs. We use JIRA for our development tasks and we had videos of micro demos, as Dave mentioned, kind of posted on Slack channels. So people were able to view those demos, um, give feedback, etc. So we've definitely seen teams manage it. Of course, it's, it's quite a challenge, but like it requires a lot of discipline and planning. And if you can get it right and get those rituals in place, it makes all the difference. And to piggyback off that, we find too, if you can create the asynchronous communication channels that you just discussed with some real-time decision-making, so you limit any blockers that will extend over a large chunk of time, say US to India or something where the team is waiting on something, um, those are some skills that uh, are needed to identify earlier. And we are going to be having a blog post come out shortly that talks just about that. So stay tuned. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one thing worth mentioning is that, um, they, I mean, of course, this isn't so much an option right now. But one thing that we have done is when we've had these extremely distributed teams, we do try to get at least one or two opportunities every couple of months or, you know, half year or year where people actually can be co-located just to kind of build those personal relationships. Because once you've actually done that just once or twice, it makes all the difference in terms of assuming people aren't being malicious or not kind of assuming the worst when you actually are then working remotely. So admittedly, we can't do that right now, but that's something to bear in mind for the future when some of these travel restrictions have lifted. Cool. Do we have uh, any other questions? I think that's it. Okay, so. Oh, so, uh, we've, so we've got a new one just popping up. Okay. Um, which is what is the best way to embed etiquette and rituals based on your experience? And for me, it's um, about having a, that deliberate com uh, conversation about what you want to do. I think unless you have that conversation, you're going to you're going to make too many uh, too many assumptions about what other people believe and understand. So, I personally think the the idea of a team charter for remote working specifically helps you at least highlight and discuss what's going well and then actually on the the next bit around adapting and emphasizing it is been um, revisiting that through retros it's a very standard retro nothing nothing special but it's about being deliberate about having that uh, uh, that conversation about what's going well, what's not going well, what actions are we going to take to address these things? Unless you have that that deliberate conversation, I think people just make assumptions and those assumptions are always wrong. And everyone's digital literacy right now, uh, with everybody working from home, some that this is their first time, you just have to be extra empathetic to say, where are we all in this in this world of working differently? And, and help and carry along those people that may need a little bit more support. So there's things that you can do from training and information that are sidebar to the overall team that you start to take everybody and get that true level set of understanding um, how to move forward. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it works really well when teams have that joint accountability for whatever it is that they're signing up to. So we've seen, for example, if um, once a team charter has been made, let's say there's an agreement that we want to use threads so that we don't add so much clutter and noise into our Slack channels, for example. Uh, 
it's really great having that conversation when we're drawing the team charter to say everybody's responsible for holding everybody accountable. That means it doesn't matter whether you're a manager or not, anybody can pull up anybody for not following what we've just agreed to as a team. And it actually gets quite fun. You can actually gamify it a little bit as well, you know, and set up very special kind of alarm emojis and whatever, you know, when someone's broken the rules. Again, we need to be very empathetic, as Lisa mentioned. You can have a bit of fun as well. Um, but it's really important to build the muscle memory for these habits. And in order to build the muscle memory, we have to be reminded when we're not following it. And not everybody's always going to be very mindful of what they're doing. So it's important for us to be able to rely on each other to call each other out as well. Right, so this... Last sort of area that uh, we wanted to focus on was, as Dave mentioned, adapting and empathizing. So these are obviously very difficult times. It's really important for us to be able to inspect and adapt based on what we're learning and based on how teams are changing. Uh, we wanted to share one quick story about how one of our clients is doing this phenomenally well. Uh, their leadership team has a rapid response team kind of allocated to the current situation that we're in. And this rapid response team has folks from procurement, from finance, from legal, from various offices uh, to make sure that any challenges that employees are facing are addressed as soon as possible. So within a very short period of time, they've managed to roll out enterprise-wide licenses for tools like Miro and Zoom. They've managed to um, make sure that there's an employee mental health care service that's available to everybody as well, especially those folks who have children at home and give them very specific exercises to try as well. Uh, and what's been really um, promising is every couple of days, someone from the senior leadership team, so someone from the C-suite will, will release like a, a two to five minute video, just kind of saying, look, here are the problems that we've heard from you or the challenges, and here's what we're going to be doing this week. And here's the feedback that we've gotten from you from the other things that we've implemented now. So just having that feedback from someone who's senior and seeing real progress makes a huge difference towards people feeling like they're being supported. Yeah, and just like I was saying before, is um, revisit your uh, 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 rev have a wrench on your ways of working for remote uh, for remotely. So go back, revisit it, be very deliberate about it. Absolutely, and tying in with what Lisa was saying, uh, shit happens, you know. Um, you know, different people have different levels of digital literacy. People's Wi-Fi can get patchy. You might speak while you're muted. Um, your home life might collide with your work life as well. And everybody's sort of adapting to things at a different pace. So it's really important for us to be able to empathize and take things at a reasonable pace. I think it's very important to acknowledge that we are not going to be as productive as we were, let's say, two months ago. You know, we're in a global pandemic. We are coping with a whole bunch of various factors. It's really important um, to be able to acknowledge that and it will take time before we start to feel motivation again, before we start to feel like we're stable again as teams, etc. So it's really important to just acknowledge these things and as cheesy as it sounds, be kind to yourself. Um, I think there was a, a question actually that's just come through around productivity and whether that increases or decreases with 100% remoting, which ties in a little bit with this. So... Um... Taking on that, I, th I think um, it's very, very hard to say at this stage. Uh, unfortunately, with one of our big clients is, a, is an amazing natural experiment, but because of what's going on, the, um, the senior management decided to uh, put a change freeze because we would have been able to measure how many releases per day, et cetera, that were happening. What we have known, uh, what we have seen though, within those teams that are outside of that change freeze is their release cadence is um, at least as good as what it was pre um, work from home. So from that point of view, um, there doesn't appear to be an impact on remote working. Now, this was, these are teams that are already well um, set up. They've got a lot of good tools to support them. Um, so they didn't have a lot of, you know, they didn't have a VPN issue or, or something like that would, that would obviously block them. Um, but there is certainly, um, I, I would say the jury's out on whether it is more or less productive at the moment because I, I haven't seen any really strong evidence either way. It's a real mixed bag, isn't it, depending on the context? Very much so. 
Yeah, I mean, part of the comment um, that we got in the question and answer was around having children kind of um, maybe interrupt your working day and having other sort of responsibilities kind of kick up in the day. Um, absolutely, that does happen. We've also seen teams actually integrate that quite a bit into their lives. So, for example, I was on a call earlier on with a founder for a startup that I'm working with, and her daughter was having a bit of a strop on the side. So she just picked her up, put her on her lap, and we just continued to have the conversation. So if we can kind of integrate some of these elements in as well and just say it's okay it's totally fine and it's just human I think that can somewhat help as well ease the pressure of feeling like you have to then compensate and work extra hard or longer hours to be able to make up for that lost time and, and I received because... a little antidotal uh, feedback from a client this week trying to get to come to this uh, webinar saying that his teams are working really really well and that the as he put it I'm just reading a bit that the elephant in the room is of course we're letting people focus on their work instead of putting them in busy, busy noisy spaces with lots of meetings um, so there's the evidence i guess it is also going to be ten, um, depend on the type of role that you are in the organization and the accessibility to the tools and information that you need mm -hmm. we're also hearing from clients where some of their modeling that they need to do forecasts run forecasts and things that have been built over years and years are all skewed now because of how quickly the pandemic came, but they're from home, they're not able to access all the information they need to quickly adjust them. Yeah, and just sort of uh, one final thing on this, having the kids, spouses, um, home life, and we kind of touched on earlier, but if you're in this, in this remote world, you can redesign your whole your whole working day. So, for example, at three o'clock, I went out had a had a half hour bike ride with my son, and that was lovely. It was, it was a beautiful sunny day. Um, I got out, had a little stretch, and and that was brilliant. Now I'm working a bit later, and that's okay. So, being able to adjust and work around some of these things can actually bring some real benefits as well. Um, as the sort of thing I wouldn't be able to get to do if I was stuck in the office, frankly. Mm. Absolutely. So in summary, we've said that working in a remote team is hard, that teams tend to be remote friendly, and we do believe teams should work remote first. The real clincher is that teams can work remote first even when they're co-located. So these really extreme remote first teams that uh, we've seen and that we have had the pleasure of working with, um, they are remote first even when they're co-located and they're in the same office together. So for example, um, we've been meetings where we've had uh, five people sit in the same meeting room, there might be two people working from home, and everybody who's in the same meeting room actually still gets on their laptop and shares their screen so people, the people who are remote can actually see their faces. And what they do is they speak into the laptop rather than at each other to equalize and still be kind of engaging in a video call. And they already have the etiquette set for the team so that the person who's organized the meeting is the one whose microphone is working and whose speaker is working. So you don't have any of those problems with interference. So there's no reason why we have to stop any of these practices or stop using any of these tools when we actually go back to working in the office, if that ever happens. Um, but the point is, like, these are really important tools and techniques that we're learning that we don't have to get rid of. So what we would like you to do is to just think about perhaps taking on some next steps. Yeah, and probably labouring the point here a little bit, the, the team charter concept, having that deliberate conversation with your colleagues about how you're working is probably the most important takeaway that we ask people to, to consider here. Um, also, when you're talking about your kit, um, consider it from the point of view of your colleagues. So <clears throat> as I say, reliable Wi-Fi, if you buy that, that 20 quid, $20 um, uh, network adapter into your Mac um, because it's worth it. It it's makes such a difference for the experience. And if you do get the opportunity to assess tools or change the, uh, the tools that you use, assess them through the lens of um, how good are they at collaboration rather than we used to use that and I'm familiar with it. So consider, it, consider that as your tool, tool choice. And look at the um, remote working team charter um, for a, a little bit of an outline and some of the other things that you might want to, uh, to, to consider discussing.
Yeah, absolutely. And uh, just in closing, please feel free to spread the word, you know, um, feel free to share this board with your colleagues. Uh, if you've got questions, drop us a line on this email address. And obviously, feel free to check out the remote working playbook. And if you'd like to contribute, again, drop us a line, we'd love to take your inputs and your insights and contribute to this book. So thank you so much for your time. Great. Well, um, thanks very much, everybody. Uh, we'll will be sending out uh, the materials that we were that, that we were talking through uh, in the webinar in an email tomorrow, um, and um, and also we'll be uh, offering uh, an opportunity to run this in a in a less formal uh, sort of Zoom session with people that that are interested in that in, in doing that with their organisations. Um, so look out for that coming out in the in the email tomorrow. But in the meantime, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, it's been a, a pleasure speaking with you all, and um, have a great day. Yeah, thanks for your questions. Thanks, everyone. See thank you. Thank you, everybody.